Allegiance. Invocation will be given by David Mackey from the Hemet San Jacinto Interfaith Council. Pledge of Allegiance by Mayor Pro Tem Russ Brown. Our Father in heaven, we come before thee in prayer. We're so grateful for all that thou has done for us, for we know and recognize that thou art the provider of all good things. We're grateful for this wonderful country we live in and the freedoms we enjoy. We're grateful for this beautiful valley we live in and, uh, and uh, the wonderful blessing it is to us. We pray for the members of this community that they will obey the, the laws of this community and treat each other with kindness and civility. We thank thee for the leaders of this community. Wilt thou bless them and help them in the decisions that they must make, that they will make those decisions that will benefit the community, that it will prosper and grow. And these things we say in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of our nation. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. Okay, can I get a report from closed session, please? Yes. Um, as to items two, three, and four in the closed session, it is being continued to the end of the regular meeting tonight. Thank you. And now we have a surprise visit by our sister city uh, students, Miramani students from Japan. And we look forward to this every year. And um, it wasn't agendized because we, they normally thought it was going to be on a Tuesday night, and here we are on Wednesday. So if we could have, who's the representation from there, Sarah? Um, we can either ask the interpreter or see, I don't see Lori Goodrich. No, I didn't either. As background, um, Miramani has, um, has been a, a sister city of the uh, city of Hemet since October 1989. So for 30 years, we've had this relationship that we've thoroughly enjoyed. Students come and stay with host families and um, get to know America a little bit better. And um, the Chaperones stay with host families as well, and we really enjoy this, have enjoyed this relationship over the many years. So if you'll introduce yourself, that would be great. Good evening. My name is Nobuko Christiansen. I was a teacher at the Little Lake Elementary School. So here I am seeing that, that the young teenagers coming from Japan, Marumori, Japan. You probably know where the Sendai is, where that the earthquake and tsunami hit. They are about uh, 30 miles or 40 miles from Sendai at the center area. But uh, their land is um, more like that the granite, so that, that the damages were very small in that area. And uh, they are because of the inland uh, city in a small town, they did not have that tsunami damages. But anyhow, they are hip, happy 13, 14 year old 8th graders and three chaperones. I would like them to stand up. And if you come up so we can get a picture as well, we always like to get a picture of the students that have come out. And I understand this is the first time to America for the chairman of um, Miramani in, in Japan. The Correct? city councilman. City councilman. Ano, minna ano mai ni atsumatte kudasai. Shashin wo torimasho. So you, uh, yeah. may you, you would like them to take a picture? Yes, please. <laughs> Thank 
And Mayor Wright, they brought some present from Japan. They would like to present to you. Thank you, Mayor, and I thank you, City Councilman. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. And I really want to um, extend my appreciation to Dartmouth School for doing this every year and hosting these students. Thank you so much. It's, it really means a lot to the community and the city. Next, we'll go on to city business, city council business. The following consent calendar items are expected to be routine in nature. They will be acted upon by the city council at one time without discussion. Any city council member, staff member, or citizen may request removal of an item from the consent calendar for discussion. Sarah, do I have anybody that wants to pull an item? Is there any staff? Yes, item 12, please, Mayor. Okay. Item 12 is being pulled. And how about council? I have a quick question on 11, but on 11. Okay, that's okay. Okay, um, so we, if I can have a motion to approve items 8, 9, 10. So moved. Please vote. And then we're going to wait a few moments while... The students leave, sorry. And that comes at 5-0. Item number 11, Carly? Um, yeah, the temp temporary extending the terms for the certain commissioners. Um, 
I know we talked about having the new, and I'm sure that I just don't know, but we have, we were talking about having the new committee. Mm -hmm. And so the planning commission isn't going to be gone, but we're going to, you guys want to, maybe you, Sarah, you want to extend that also? Yes, we do want to extend that. We are asking to extend the, Hold on, sorry about that. The Planning Commission as well, because they did not receive many new applications. They had one resignation, and based on your action last time, without us making any reappointments, we will actually be at a two members and have no quorum on April 1st. They also have some a couple big projects coming, so they were just asking for two more months to get through John Gifford's resignation. Um, we do have a term expiration that. Lori Van Arsdale is just covering, and so mm -hmm. give us two months. We'll know better what we're going to do with the infrastructure committee, and then we can move forward on, on uh, requesting applications for that committee. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'll, I'll move to approve. Okay. May I have a second? Second. Please vote. Uh, Carly. Okay. And that passes 5-0. Going on to item number 12. Yes, uh, Chris Jensen, our public works director, has um, some items you'd like to clarify for the council and the public. Thank you, Jensen. Mr. Lopez. Um, Mayor, council, good evening. We um, actually had a couple of minor, a handful of minor changes to the agreement that was attached to this um, staff report. And so um, we want to go ahead and get that exchanged out at the request of council in the past. You've actually got a redlined agreement that also has some really pretty blue highlights in it um, that will point out those changes. While I'm up here, though, I just wanted um, for you as well as for the public to just kind of hit some highlights in terms of this item. Um, I do know that it does have a, a big dollar amount tied to it. There's a lot of information in the staff report. So I just kind of wanted to quickly walk you through uh, a pinch of the history behind it, um, let you know what we're looking for tonight, um, and then if you want to, we can we can walk through the, the changes that have been made to the agreement, which, by the way, have already been vetted through the city, um, city attorney's office. Um, they really are kind of non-substantial changes, and um, if there's questions about that, um, Stephanie can help us with that. So just very quickly, um, you're all aware that we have a... Um, number of community facility districts, a couple of CFDs as we call them. One is for public safety and one is for the Heartland District. And we also have um, over 50 lighting and landscape <coughs> maintenance districts. And these special districts serve to provide revenue for us to be able to perform maintenance in um, city public right away, to provide public safety services. And the funding for those come from assessments that are made to properties that are tied and how get a direct benefit from those districts. So in terms of kind of what it takes to administer that, we have annual services that, that we have to perform. We have to go through and look at every single district budget. We literally have close to 60 separate budgets that we look at. Um, there's submission of information to the County of Riverside Assessor's Office so that they can collect those assessments for us. And we also um, have things like weed abatement um, assessments and items like that that we have actually been contracted for about the last four and a half years with a company by the name of Somas. I'm sure that you've heard that, that name before. What we found out in December, and it was on some fairly short notice, is that SOMAS was actually transitioning out of providing those services. One of the good news pieces to that, though, is that the transition meant that their staff was remaining locally and moving to a new company called Harrison Associates that um, would be providing those services. So while we weren't quite prepared to make the transition on December 31st, we only had a couple of weeks notice, um, we have been working and through direct negotiation with Harris, we have actually secured a new agreement that has costs associated with it that are actually less than we previously had with SOMAS. And what we are looking to do tonight, the, the support that we have received from the staff that is now Harris staff, 
is critical for us to get through this budget process that we're in the middle of in addition they also are assisting us with many active projects that we have on the table so for example the SCE street light acquisition they're assisting with the initial pieces um, of the McSweeney development and the Cactus Valley wash CFD so there's a lot of kind of active parts that if we were to, to yank and put a new company in right now we would be, have about a six to eight month learning curve um, so we were actually happy on the staff side to hear that we would be able to retain um, members that we've already established a rapport with that we have a great working relationship with and that come understanding what can be our very complex and complicated processes and as well as just that institutional knowledge and historical knowledge of each of our districts and believe me they each have their own history so with that said we negotiated an agreement for services the recommendation on the staff report you'll see has a request to approve an amount of three hundred and thirty eight thousand dollars or three hundred thirty eight thousand two hundred sixty two dollars and sixty one cents what I want to be really clear about is that this amount actually represents the full five years of this contract Sure. Um, Tony, could you go out in the hallway and have your discussion? Because it's kind of hard to hear her and listen to you as well. Thank you. Sorry. So the the amount here that you see in um, the recommendation in number one is to approve the award of the agreement in the full amount of the agreement. What we wanted to do, we've had requests from council in the past. I know that there's been some concern over amendments continually coming back. So we've taken a different approach with the staff report. In the agreement, we've actually included the not to exceed amount for the full five years, but we are actually only going to be administratively awarding the initial term, which is three years. We just want council to know the not to exceed amount for the full five is the 338. There is a table in your staff report that actually breaks down kind of the, the cumulative amount and shows you where that comes from. The other um, piece of the puzzle with a, acknowledging this five-year amount is it locks in the pricing for us. So when we're talking about budgets and we're wondering what to expect from these contractual increases that we've talked about, we've already got it dialed in. So that's where that big number came from. I just wanted to make sure everybody understood that and it is at a savings. Lastly, um, just to be very clear, the the services that we're locking the amount in for are for the annual services for our budgeting services um, that they do for us annually as the city they've also provided unit pricing and hourly costs when we're talking about things like new formations of districts those are separate from this amount and those much like the um, you know plan check fees that are that are charged to developers when a developer comes in to form a district they're actually responsible for the amount of the formation we take a deposit and that work is paid for out of those deposits so you truly are looking at a not to exceed amount for the annual services and again for a five-year period which we would only expend completely if in years four and five we decide to go ahead and renew the agreement and exercise that option so there's a lot going on here I thought I had to come up here anyway I might as well um, just kind of give you all the pieces of the puzzle so well first of all I want to say we had an earlier discussion on this item because uh, I had some questions about it that I um, asked Chris about and in that conversation I want to um, commend you for negotiating that cost as well because I understand initially it was a lot higher than that so I appreciate that for sure and I think a 2% escalator is a reasonable amount uh, as we move forward and um, cost of service go up as the year uh, years go on so uh, thank you for uh, doing that and being responsible in that regard um, any does council have any other questions for Chris on this item I don't have a question, but I want you to feel encouraged because we've been asking and we've been very hard on you on um, lots of contracts that you've brought up. And so I appreciate you um, doing this the way that we wanted to see and for the negotiation. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any public comment that anybody wants to make on this item? 
Hearing none, um, may I have a motion and a second, please? I'll move to approve. Second. Please vote. And that passes 5 0. Thank you, Council. Next item, moving forward, is communications from the public. Anyone who wishes to address the council uh, should have given the city clerk a form of their name and address. Uh, your speakers are limited to three minutes in consideration of others, others that want to speak. Please come forward to the lectern when your name is called. As you know, state prohibits the city council from discussing any item not on the agenda except for brief responses and statements made or questions posed to the public. In addition, we may ask a question for clarification, provide a reference to staff or other resources for factual information, or if necessary, request staff to report back at a subsequent meeting. Sarah, do we have any requests to speak? No, we do. Your first speaker will be Connie Clark, and she will be followed by Donna Barnett. Please be prepared to speak if you're the following speaker. Good evening. I would like to introduce myself. I'm Connie Howard Clark. I was born and raised here in Hemet. About mid-70s we moved and uh, recently my father passed away and I inherited his home and I came back to <coughs> the place I consider my home. Um, for the past 30 years before that, I resided in Fortuna, California, which is in Humboldt uh, County and that is known to most of uh, the world as the Emerald Triangle. I have a BA in history. I've been married to the same man for 34 years. He is a retired law enforcement. We were very active politically and um, socially in the community there. I have three grown children, 11 grandkids. My work experience is that I was a medical administrator for many years. I was a business owner and I also was a substitute teacher for junior high students. I also participated in coaching junior high girls softball. I lived in Humboldt when the mom and pop growers were pretty much non-seen. I stayed in Humboldt for 30 years and I have seen it what it's gone to today. Back in 1985, a pound of marijuana sold for approximately $3,500. Get on a scale, folks. Now they are selling maybe last year's at $700 just to get rid of the bag. I was even in a small, small town in a small island in the Caribbean, and the man next to me asked me who, where I came from, and I said, Oh, little town, Humboldt County. Oh, yeah, 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 he knew. Um, since I was 18, I have voted in every election that I've been eligible for. I voted in favor for Measure Z. I voted because I thought the city council could get educated and the city make informed decisions and the city would then have a cohesive plan. I would like to see that for the city, pro or con. Uh, on Monday, I dropped off a volunteer application that I labeled, quote unquote, any future Measure Z committee. I want to make very clear that I understand there are no such committees even in the process. But I would like you all to have it as my interest card. Um, I know this is a bad time. I know there's a lot of turmoil and I know there's stuff going on. I'm not into that. Ms. Um, Clark, can you wrap it up? Your time yeah. is up. So if you can just add a couple more sentences. Yes, but we are in March and April. And so January 2019, you guys gave yourselves, or we have, until December um, 31st, 2020. Um, I would like to see the council move forward on this. You all 
uh, with my students. We crammed at the end. Please don't let the city cram at the end. I would respectfully submit um, an interest in the committee, and I would like to see us move forward so that we are not caught cramming at the end. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Next speaker, please. Ms. Barnett will be followed by Tyrone. My name is Donna Barnett. I've lived in Hemet for 16 and a half years. An honorable mayor and members of the city council, I have come here tonight to ask for your assistance. <coughs> Excuse me. I have a neighbor who lives at 475 South Carmelita Street. I hope that you write down the address and question your code enforcement officers, police officers, and city attorney's office about this address, as they all have been involved with him at some point in time. My neighbor is a hoarder who fills his house and property full of trash and junk. In December of 2016, we and many of our neighbors started to complain about the amount of junk in his yard and the eyesore that it had become. It took nearly two years of almost weekly complaints before any action was taken. When the city intervened, they spent a week and hauled 16 40-yard containers of junk out of his yard. His house was so also full, and they eventually removed all of that as well. They condemned the house, red-tagged it, and cut off all the utilities to it. The city spent tens of thousands of dollars to clean this place up. After this experience, the house is still red-tagged, but the city allowed them to be there and continue to fill the house again with more junk. The notice reads, unsafe to occupy, yet they continue to let him occupy the house. He is not supposed to live there, but he does. This has been reported over and over, but still it continues. He has no visible means of support and does nothing to support this community, or its businesses, or its leaders. We are hardworking people who spend our money in our community, support our local businesses, and have an interest in supporting our local government to make this a better community. We invest in our, in our house and our property so that we can be comfortable and our house is appealing to others in the community. Cities like ours develop rules and codes for their residents to follow that are supposed to protect us from situations exactly like this. We are, all we are asking is for the city to enforce the codes that it decided were needed to protect the rest of the community. When decent law-abiding citizens in this community get to get fed up and decide to move on, our neighbor is a legacy that the city will be left with. Thank you. I and I will tell you, um, Ms. Barnett, that the acting city manager has your information, and staff will follow up with you, okay? Right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Good evening, Honorable City Council members. Uh, my name is Tyrone Klingweil. Please allow me to introduce myself. Uh, I recently retired from the Marine Corps after 22 years of service. Uh, I moved to Hemet in uh, 2000 and, I'm sorry, 1999. I purchased a home on uh, 455 South Carmelita Street in 2001, and I've lived there ever since, periodically between deployments. Um, I'm actually speaking in the same thing that Donna just spoke about. <coughs> The house that's on our street is hideous. I, I can't explain it any more than that. And what I ask of you is if in your free time, we live, this house is six blocks away. In your time, whenever it's convenient for you, I ask you please drive by. Take a look at what we see every day. I understand my little piece of- And that of, address is? That address is 475 Manor. I ask that you please take a look at this. Um, I could bring photos, but photo, photos don't do enough. Um, I get it. I live in a very small part of the town. It's my little world. You all have a lot more going on, and I understand that. <clears throat> I ask that you just please take a look at it and help me help you. As a Marine, I always ha come up with a problem and a solution. I don't have the solution. <coughs> I've contacted code enforcement, talked to code enforcement, gone to City Hall, we talked to the police on occasions that were out of control. I don't have the answer, so if you could help me out with that, I would very much appreciate it. Great. Thank you. And as I mentioned to Ms. Barnett, that um, Chris Lopez has the information, and he'll follow up with staff on that, okay? Thank you very much. Thank you for coming out.
evening. Yes, my name is John Brookhart. I'm the former court enforcement commissioner for Pasadena, Rose Bowl, Tournament of Rose, all that stuff. And I moved here uh, in 2005, 2015. And uh, the, the members of the Seattle Basie residents that are watching this tonight, I am no longer going to be able to represent you with the basin because I have decided to uh, do some other things because uh, I'm not sure that we're actually being taken seriously even though we're responsible for the, the school the straight being open so that people can go to the schools for the last two months where they probably would have been closed due to the rain and the uh, disaster of basin and stuff. Um, we have uh, tried to let the city let us know that we should be, uh, they should say something nice about us instead of just using the word basin. Uh, about uh, last week, I got a call from uh, Chuck Washington's office asking me that somebody had, had uh, asked if I would be interested in being on some commission dealing with the flood control. And I said, I would probably be honored, but I would not feel that the city council or the city of Hemet respects me enough to think that I could do that job because they have never mentioned anything about us or me or the people that have made it possible for that zoning thing. And we have been responsible for making sure that the school district does not keep flooding that place because the basin has to go from the school district down to us and we don't get any response from anybody. So I am not sure I could handle that without actually having the city council feel that I and good enough to represent the city in the sense of doing something for the commission, but it's not a problem. So I made that made that uh, thing up for you that shows everything that you've done for us and everything we've done for you, and that Hammett is the largest school district in California, and it should be respected and things should be done for it. Those of you that had kids go to that school, if you saw the water and you saw the damaged cars were flooded on our street in the street, and when we try to talk to you about it to try to work something out with the county, you don't have to pay anything for that stuff. They gotta pay for it. This is a disaster. Anyway, thank you, and um, I probably will never come before you again unless I'm asked by somebody specific. Uh, Council Member Percival, uh, do you have a question for clarification? I, I do want to make well more of a comment. I want to first. I want to thank you for coming out, and I do want you to know that um, I'm the one who contacted Chuck Washington for him to reach out because I'm the one who made the recommendation for you to be on a commission for the county. And and that's why his office called you. Okay. So I just want you to be aware of that. Well, thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you, Mr. Burkhart. Do you have another speaker? We do, we have a few more. So the next one is Pebbles Moreno and she'll be followed by Howard Rosenthal. Hi, I'm Pebbles Morenos from Homicide Family Seeking Justice. Um, Bonnie, I know you got my little thing I posted on your face about homicide awareness. Governor Brown, before he left office, said every community should honor homicide families. Any victim that was that died to homicide should be honored in their community. But him, it doesn't honor no missing children, no homicide families, nothing. This city does, is not aware about who has died or anything. Um, Bonnie was running election for mayor when my son died November 2016, November 4th. She won her election because that morning she used my son, his death, but I wasn't notified till November 10th. And then she stepped down. So you know what, as a mother losing a son to homicide, somebody that wasn't even gang active, she should honor the city of him and San Jacinto with a banner showing all the homicide victims that have lost their lives. We lost a Marine here. He fought in Afghanistan, Desert Storms, the Miles family. He died on Father's Day on Harvard. There was many people recording that incident and the cops did not confiscate phones to catch the capture of the killer that was stabbing them or anything, and you know what? That family has no peace. So you know what? As a city, we should honor the Miles family 
and have them displayed on a banner or something with or without the console, I'm going to do it. And I have something, if you all look me up on homicide families, I'm asking for any homicide victim that has died in him and San Estadino to bring your picture and let's have them on a banner for awareness. Because if these members don't care about the lives that, that got lost in our community, our children we lost, us as parents, we care. These are our children that died to homicide. Bonnie said we dropped the ball. We honor it. In a private meeting we had with Chief Brown. And you know what? Mer Karupa came out when I pushed up here at these council meetings and we did the war on crime. After my son died, his victim, the guys that killed my son got captured the night of the Riverside Candlelight. Detective Hall went to my house and said, we captured them. Chief of Police said for me to come tell you before you do this and you do that. But you know what? I, I accepted it. I went to the war on crime. She came out and extended her hand, and I didn't even want to shake Karupa's hand because she's fake. But you know what? She said, you know what? My heart goes out to you. Let's start fresh. And I reached out my hand and said, let's go and let's start fresh. Forgive and forget, like God says, let's start new. She reached out to me one time and said, and you know what my thing was? The summer's coming. I know your time is up. Can you the summer's coming. Wrap up, please. It's about children. One person in this community could change the life of a good student. Council members have money to pay off everybody. Thank you, Let's, let's get activities. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, members of Council. Today, this morning, something really exciting happened here for our city. For the first time in almost 100 years, in the scientific community worldwide, a new big critter species was identified. His name is Max. The Diamond Valley Collection in the Western Science Center led scientific research that discovered for the first time that the mammoths of California are a completely different species. 50% of all of those mastodons, not mammoths, excuse me, are at the Western Science Center. 50% of all of them from the state of California. The collection of mastodon bones at the Western Science Center in Hemet is the largest collection in the world. Pretty positive. Major networks were there, local newspapers. Four years of research. We're about to start the Lori, the 96th yes. running of the Ramona play. Last night, the Saboba Band of Indians, as you all know, I think you're probably all there, opened up what is major economic news for the Valley. The wildflowers were in the New York Times mentioning Hemet, which my friend Gisla mentioned it wasn't the first time we've made the New York Times. There is beauty here. This is a great place. Most of us choose to live here because of that. I ask you five council members with your acting management team, do what needs to be done, all the disagreements behind, Internet is un it, it, we're not able to measure the effect on retail, yet we see we're losing sales tax dollars in good economy. We've got to be ready when the next economy is not so good. The moment is now to bring everybody together, go after your deficit, be transparent, good or bad news, the public will trust, and make good things happen for this great place. Thank you. Thank you, Howard. Um, I want to say, first of all, thank you very much to the city for um, trying to address the issue of a street light 
at uh, the corner of Warren and Auto Mall. Um, Chris has been uh, instrumental in information on that and trying to keep that forward, moving forward. So I do appreciate, I know there are challenges as it relates to environmental issues and some other things, but it is an important safety issue for the city on that, on that uh, far west side of the valley. About two and a half months ago on, on another subject, um, former city manager Alan Parker wanted to have lunch with me at his expense. So we went to Los Vaqueros and he wanted to talk about the auto mall and you know, and, and, and sales tax, and how can we how can we increase sales tax? That was the the agenda. I have to say that I have never been more disappointed or frustrated with a meeting of a senior, supposed senior manager of any organization, than that one with him. Really, what he wanted to talk about was what he did 25, 35 years ago at other cities or, or, or organizations and really really didn't have, uh, after I approached him several times about the city of Hammett and our current um, budget situation, really didn't have any ideas or really any interest in talking about that. I was really kind of, in my first meeting with him, I'd talked to him before several times and just standing around and, in groups and such, but I was flabbergasted at the lack of energy at the lack of enthusiasm and the lack of commitment to anything as it relates to the city of Emmett. Bottom line, um, he was a zero, unfortunately. I'm sure he was a great gentleman in his previous careers. For the city of Emmett, he did not do much. I would not have hired that gentleman if he had come in and wanted to be any position in my organization. So a mistake was made. I don't know how it happened. I don't know who was involved in bringing that person to our city, and certainly the mistakes have been made before over decades of city councils, not anyone in particular. As well, I think the previous decisions have all been 5-0. Maybe there, has there been a dissension in, in an in a election of a city manager in the last, you know, 10 years? I don't think so. I don't think any city council member of anyone has ever dissented. The cost of, of, of letting him go is far less than the cost of retaining him. Unfortunately, it's a decision that uh, I think is a, a proper one, a wise one, and uh, time to, when it's time to cut bait, you cut bait. Unfortunately, and, but you do. So, and you move forward with the city council and the city uh, as best you can. So, um, I think it's the right decision for the city to make that. Unfortunately, I know I'm speaking not well to the gentleman, but that's my personal opinion of it. And uh, I hope the city can um, can work together to find a qualified city manager that'll that'll lead us in the future. That is your most important job. Your most important job is hiring a qualified person. Thank, Thank you. you. Eric. Sharon Duber. Good evening. Thanks to uh, Howard and Eric, they made this easy for me. They set the stage because I want to speak to the same thing. Um, I commend all of you on an extremely difficult decision that you had to make on March the 12th to terminate an unproductive uh, senior executive in our city. Uh, uh, my name is Sharon Duber. I've lived in this city for 15 years. I live in Four Seasons. And as most of you know, I've been fairly active in our city. Um, was um, privileged to be part of the GPAC committee back when um, we were working on the general plan that rolled forward, I believe, in January 2012. Um, Robin's not looking this way, but I think it was January 2012. <laughs> My memory serves. I want to commend you on a difficult decision, and in moving forward, I echo Howard Rosenthal word for word. Let's put the past behind us. The window is short. I personally would not like to see us repeat where we've been in the last, I would say, 10 to 15 years. Uh, I love this city. I um, honestly have wanted to leave a couple times, but I'm still here. And I love it for all the reasons that Howard stated. It's a beautiful valley with a lot of good, earnest, sincere people in this valley. And I believe that you've made a correct decision. Uh, for the moment, I'm speaking to Agenda 7 in closed session to appoint your interim city manager. 
of Chris Lopez. I'm hearing good things that he's proactive, uh, working diligently on a budget to move us forward. And just want to be on record to say that I applaud your effort and thank you. We'd like to see more of it. Thank you. Thank you. That was all. Okay. Um, next item on the agenda, discussion and action item. Uh, number 13, allocations of 2019-20 program year community development block grant, CBD entitlement and previously unexpended funding. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm here tonight to present the Ad Hoc Committee's 2019-2020 CDBG funding recommendations. The, this year's CDBG process began with application, or with application workshops that were held on November 7th and 8th. Three public service applications, applicants attended, and four city departments were represented at the workshops. The city received a total of 10 applications totaling almost a million dollars. At the meeting on Tuesday, December 11th, the city held a public hearing at the regular council meeting to receive comments and views on housing and community development needs. At that meeting, the ad hoc committee comprised of Mayor Pro Tem Brown and Council Member Percival was reactivated. The ad hoc committee reviewed the applications and selected funding recommendations in March of 2019 for full council approval. The funding recommendations were attached to the staff report for your review. And at this time, it's requested that the full council approve the 1920 CDBG funding recommendations as presented in the report for incorporation into the draft 1920 annual action plan. The draft plan needs to be completed and available for the required 30-day public review and comment period no later than Monday, April 1st of 2019 to meet the subsequent, subsequent CDBG 1920 program funding deadlines. Following the 30-day public review, this matter will return to the City Council for a mandatory public hearing and final council adoption. Submission to HUD of the final 1920 annual action plan must occur before May 15th of 2019 in order for the city to receive its CDBG funding for the year. So with that, if you have any questions for me or for the ad hoc committee who reviewed those, um, we can, I can answer any questions for you. Anybody have any questions? <laughs> okay, I just have two questions. Uh, one is on the from the City of Hemet Community Development for Crime Free Housing Program that they the amount requested is thirty five thousand and yet you're awarding forty thousand five hundred. Why? Do you want to answer? Go ahead. Okay, so we increased because there was additional funding available, so they asked for less, we had more available, we added it to it. And what is that going to do? What is that program? It's going to give them more. Um, I've only been to one of the meetings. They hold the meetings at um, the Association of Realtors <laughs> office, open to the public, and it will give um, more opportunity for him to come out. And this is for John Smart? Yeah, crime free housing. Okay, all right. And the second is on Valleywide uh, Recreation Park District, the 75000 What exactly is that for Jerry Searle Park? And why then? Needless to say, it's, it's always a difficult decision when you're looking at allocating funds. Uh, the particular uh, aspect of uh, Valleywide, we felt that they, they were receiving uh, a fair amount of, of uh, revenue sources and, and doing a number of good things. But in light of having to balance and compare we just felt that it was appropriate to uh, give them a little bit less. But what are the projects? <clears throat> Excuse me. I guess that's the main question. What, what projects and what improvements are they going to do to that park? Do we know? I would have to look back in my in my binder here. 
I believe Tiffany, our accounting manager, has the answer to that. It's to make the park ADA compliant in the ramps, the restrooms, to make it more accessible. Okay. And then to let you know, back on for the crime-free housing, too, our intent was to utilize some of the funding to internally fund some of the positions when the gals times are, when they're used to work on the program itself. We can cost off some of the admin expenses to the CDBG fund versus the general fund. Thank you. Is there anybody on the public that wishes to speak on any of these items? Good evening, Mayor, Council. Odd to be in this spot. I'm used to being in that spot. Let's see what everybody else has to say. I'm glad you asked that question. The money would be used to improve accessibility at Searle Park. All the money would go towards any construction or work that needs to be done at the park. It wouldn't go towards planning or staff time. We're in the process of working on accessibility at all of our parks. And Searle Park is one of three parks that we operate in Hemet. We operate 84 parks, 13 rec centers throughout our district, which stretches from French Valley up to Winchester, part of Menifee, Hemet, San Jacinto, Val Vista, and one center in Owanga. We have three parks specifically that are in Hemet, in Searle Park, Bill Gray Park, and Diamond Valley Lake Park. Searle Park is used for ball games, used for classes, a lot of exercise classes there. And like the young lady said, we're using it to improve the accessibility of the park. And I want to say Dean Wetter, our general manager, apologizes he couldn't be here tonight. Said you have to see me. Sorry about that. But Dean and our board appreciate any consideration for these funds. And I'll answer any more questions you may have. Thank you for the clarification and information. Okay, if there's no other comments or questions, may I have a motion? I would just like to thank the staff for the preparation that went into our ad hoc committee. We were both provided this very complete binder that not only had the information that we needed to address for the applications, but it had a historical profile that we could look back at previous allocations and requests. And neither one of the staff members have that responsibility as anything other than a collateral duty. And Kaylee? Kalina. Yeah, and she picked it up midstream and did a really good job. So thank you to the staff for their work in doing this on a collateral basis. We've had a lot of recent turnover with retirements, and Tiffany and Kalina have really stepped up to the plate and taken on duties that aren't normally theirs and had to learn the program. And it shows in what they've provided for you that they're doing a great job. And I appreciate it from my department. Very much appreciated. Okay. And with that, go ahead with the motion. I'll move to approve the ad hoc committee's recommendations for the CDBG funding. Do I have a second? I'll second. Please vote. Ah, don't do that yet. It's stuck. Okay. She had already done it, and it was a 4-1, and I'm assuming you meant to make it a 5-0. That's correct. So the results were 5-0. Thank you. Moving on to item number 14, tree trimming operation report by Acting City Manager Lopez. Good evening again. By way of background, I want to provide some more information on this item. 
the Mayor and City Council meeting of November 13, 2018, the City Council directed staff to look into the tree trimming operation and provide information related to contracting options. At the Mayor and City Council meeting of January 8, 2019, the City Council directed staff to look into the tree trimming practices of neighboring cities. And so what I wanted to do tonight is go over that presentation that we had on January 8th, refresh everybody about uh, the conversation we had back then, and then also provide the updates as it relates to the items that the Council directed staff to look into. So again, forestry, what are we talking about here? This covers the maintenance and operation activities related to trees and shrubs in or on the public right of way. And so part of that comprehensive program includes uh, forestry planning, inventorying species and condition, planting, pruning, and of course, removal of dead, diseased, and hazardous trees. So Hammett's program is overseen by the Refuse Superintendent. Uh, underneath him, he's got a supervisor, and then the staff related to the tree trimming operation. Six FTEs, three crews of two. Uh, some of the highlights over the course of one year from October 2017 to October 2018. Some of the highlights include 78 trees that were planted, 326 trees that were stumped, and 1,421 trees that were trimmed during that time. The city's most recent estimate shows approximately 24,000 trees that are the city's responsibility. So as you'll recall, uh, a port the tree trimming program is covered through multiple different funds. As you'll recall from our earlier budget conversation, uh, we've got uh, other funds, pre-218 district, uh, assessment district, uh, that contributes to the portion of that cost, as well as post-218 assessment districts, and a general fund component of approximately 151898 And you can see that uh, personnel-wise, 58% of the budget is allocated for personnel, an additional amount is for maintenance and operations and some internal service funds of liability fleet uh, of about 33 percent or 343,820 for a total program cost of just over one million dollars. So Hammett's program is not just trimming trees, there are other duties that are assigned for the program. Approximately 85% of the work that they do do is for tree trimming. Uh, the balance, 15%, is spent uh, installing banners and other types of special requests as needed throughout the community. Uh, the city currently does use a contractor to trim approximately 1,000 palms at a cost of $40,000 per fiscal year. So now I'll get into some of the advantages and disadvantages of uh, the different staffing models. So starting on the left-hand column, some of the advantages with respect to in-house staffing. Uh, there are ties to the community. There's institutional knowledge. They can respond quickly to other tasks as needed. They are accountable to the director. No administra administrative time is needed to oversee a contract and can respond to emergencies more quickly. Um, I'll clarify that. Uh, the administrative time, there is some administrative time necessary to oversee the contract for the trimming of the palm, so that's not uh, entirely uh, the case in our situation. Some of the in-house staff disadvantages, they may only have limited experience of urban forest management. Uh, investments must be made in equipment and maintenance, which can be very, very costly. This was actually the uh, item that caused this discussion as it related to the purchase of some trucks to continue on the operation, having it in-house. Uh, the agency should invest time and funding for obtaining and, in, and maintaining certifications, licenses, and other training as needed. The removal from positions if, if performance is substandard can be difficult. Staff is paid irrespective of quantity, quality, or efficiency of work. The city is responsible for damage caused by workers and the city is responsible for on-the-job injuries and workers' compensation.